this week on the Million Dollar Plan, we're going to give you a, a look at what could be for you. You know, we always talk to people who are maybe uh, need some help with their financial life and they're aspiring to do something different. How about we bring to you an example of how to do it? What, what does it look like when you've done it right, living your best life? And so we welcome Mike to the program now. Mike, welcome to the Million Dollar Plan. Thank you, Pete. It's uh, fun to be here. Your Million Dollar Day is a while ago. <laughs> because you uh, you you uh, you are a millionaire. You're you're 61 years old. You retired from your full time work of a long, almost four decade career uh, when you reached the age of 60, and now you are doing what everyone is trying to aspire to do, which is to, uh, to well, frankly do whatever you want and make good good decisions. Tell us tell us how we got to this point. Uh, what, what, what was your career? What were you earning at the height of your career? And, and, and tell us about that whole retirement process. Sure. I, uh, I'm a chemical engineer, which is, uh, uh, there aren't many people that major in that. Sure. I can't imagine why it's, it's a ton of fun in school, <laughs> but, uh, I suppose you have to have a certain mindset to do it. And, uh, uh, the way we got there, uh, one, I married extremely well. Okay. Uh, I married a, uh, my wife for 39 years now uh, still. She's keeping me as her starter husband. Nice. But uh, she, had, she came from a very modest background. She worked on a, or she lived on a small farm where she was one of the farm hands, and so she was no stranger to work. And, uh, uh, well, they didn't even have running water in their house until she got to junior high. So okay. This was, uh, you know, for our state, that's not that unusual. But... Uh, uh, so we lived very modestly. We had very modest rent, and then we bought a very small house, which we're still in 39 years later. Hmm. We bought modest cars. I still buy used cars. You know, I've got a net worth north of uh, $3 million, but I just can't bring myself to buy a fancy new car most of the time. Uh, we raised our kids. Uh, one of the ways we controlled expenses is she, uh, she spent a great deal of time on them and uh, taught them to learn, to learn, or to love to learn, and... Uh, so they all managed to go to college completely free. Wow. Tuition, room and board books, even though we had the means to send them. Uh, they, there were plenty of me, me, non-means-tested scholarships out there if you look hard enough, and uh, they found enough to cover everything. And so, then, uh, you know, on the other side of controlling expenses, it was maximizing income. Uh, I found a job that I was good at and that I loved doing uh, all the way up to the day I retired, and... Uh, Treated it like a friendly competition and, uh, you know, went from an entry-level job to running the place before I left. And uh, income probably averaged around, of course, you got to realize, 38 years ago. Yeah. Pay wasn't much. I started at 18000 uh, I probably made around 100000 most of my career, but the last few years we were taken over by a public uh, Fortune 500 company, and uh, the pay got a lot better. I became a corporate guy, and I think my last year I was, over four hundred thousand. Okay, but outside of the last three years, I was I was between one hundred and two hundred thousand for say the ten or fifteen years before that, probably. So we would describe sort of your career as a frugal, uh, a wise, a resourceful uh, career. I mean, prior to those four hundred thousand dollar years, I mean, you've got a net worth of roughly three million dollars now. Prior to those big years, what, what we'll call them. Uh, what do you think your net worth was then? Were you really maximizing your savings during those big earning years? I probably, uh, I didn't get into this community until recently. I guess it, it's probably pretty recent that the whole financial independence and early retirement type mm -hmm. movements have gotten popular. But uh, we could have saved a little more, I think. But, but, you know, compared to most people, I'd say our savings rate was probably... Uh, 20 to 25 percent sure. through most most of our career. And, you, My wife stopped working pretty early to, to, to raise kids, and uh, so we did it on a single income. Do you and we also always gave over 10 percent of our gross uh, to the church and to other nonprofits. Do, do you think that without the big years, all of this would have still been possible, and do you think you currently would still be retired if the big years had not happened uh, like they did the last few? Oh, yes, I do. I mean, I, I I think I could live comfortably on the proceeds of probably a million and a half dollars, so I have about twice what I need. And uh, we did save a great deal of the, uh, the last three years of the income, but it's just probably going to 
be handed down to our kids because we don't spend any more now than we did then. So you talk about you think you could live comfortably off a million and a half. What sort of distribution rate are you using, withdrawal rate, uh, in your mind? Well, a million and a half, I would be up around 4%. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm between two and, two and a half, but right now it's actually zero. Right. And the kind of side gigs I'm doing have a lot of longevity. I had planned these for decades. Uh, uh, they're not the kind of work, as long as your mind stays sharp, you can do them into your 70s. So Because they're fun, which is why I'm doing them, I don't expect to take anything out of my investments until I, at least at 70. So you currently have still have a gross annual earned income of $108,000 a year as a financially independent retiree, um, and you work four side gigs. Can you tell us about those side gigs? Are they sorts sure. of things that anybody could get into? Well, they're... They're the sort of things anyone could develop. Now, they would be different side gigs for other people, but, but in my case, uh, I was a chemical engineer, and I worked at a chemical plant and uh, designed equipment, and then later was a plant manager and ran the facility. Uh, that's not what I do as side gigs, but part of what we did is we bought a tremendous amount of natural gas and electricity, and so I got involved in utility regulations because... Uh, utility rates are a big deal when you're paying $40 million a year in, right. in utility bills. So uh, because of that side knowledge and knowing that, that all the other companies in the state need some help on that, I do regulatory consulting on, on both on utility areas now, and uh, that's, that's probably 75% of my work. And that's I fun also, to you? You say that's fun? I mean, you enjoy yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't sound like that to most people, but because I know how to do it, and I spent maybe... Five percent of my time in my career doing that, uh, it's kind of like duck soup. Sure. It's, it's, it's interesting, and it's mentally challenging, which is good, because I don't want to sit around and gather dust. I also uh, do contract lobbying. I, uh, for our company, because we didn't have a lobbyist, uh, I went to D.C. and testified before the House and the Senate and did all the lobbyist stuff uh, whenever we needed to do that. And that's a skill set that not everybody has, and it had nothing to do with engineering. I just volunteered for it because I thought that would be a cool thing to do after I retired. So that and, seems and it kind of is. Yeah, I, I don't understand a whole lot about lobbying. I mean, I, I guess what I don't understand about lobbying is, is it just a matter of conversations trying to get people who vote to see your point of view? I mean, is that the essence of it? That really is it. I, there's never any money. You can't buy you can't even buy a congressional staff or a Coke. Oh. The laws are so strict. So there is no, uh, there may be some, can if your company had a pack, but ours didn't, you could you could give donations, but I never donated anything. Uh, I just uh, uh, explained to them what our side of the argument was, what the other people's side of the argument was, and why I thought we were right. And the con uh, congressmen, senators, they depend on that because they're a mile wide, but they're only an inch deep because they have to be such generalists. They need you know, experts that have some credibility that can explain the whole problem to them and then let them do what they think is best. And that's, so, that's all I ever try to do. Not that we're going to make this show about lobbying or uh, money in politics, but I'm guessing that the industry of lobbying has changed with the introduction of PACs and, and their ability to sort of offset lobbying with contributions. It, it probably has. I do more state-level lobbying now. Okay. Uh, just because it's more convenient for me. Um, uh, but... But generally, I was lobbying for all the chemical plants that were like mine. I, I would work for a trade association, or I'd be donated by my company for that. And so typically when I do something like that, it's for a group of companies. And uh, I'm not involved on the, on the fundraising or the donation side of it. I'm not sure actually what the individual companies do. I'm just kind of there because I have always had a knack for taking something very complicated and explaining it in layman's terms. So, so we've got, uh, our, our, you know, we've got regulation, uh, we, we've got a uh, uh, consultant, we've got lobbyist. What are the other two gigs? Well, there's two different regulatory consultants for natural gas and electricity. And then the, the fourth one, the final one, is uh, as an expert witness in litigation. Nice. So you go when there's a, a chemical, is it a utility or chemical issue that you... Uh, now, th this is back in my own uh, chemical area. This okay. is when there's an explosion or a fire at a facility. Uh, generally, there ends up being a dispute between the insurance company and the uh, uh, company that had the accident, and I typically am testifying on behalf of the company that had the accident as to why this should be a valid insurance claim. Have you ever been badgered? Oh, gosh, 
yeah. Uh, typical experience is seven hours in front of a video cam like, with two hostile lawyers grilling you, trying to get you to contradict one thing you said in your 60-page report. Do you Have you thought about getting a T-shirt made that has a badger on it that says, don't badger me, bro? I mean, have you thought about <laughs> no, doing that? That's a good idea. I have now. So that's amazing. Okay, so you you got to keep – the thing is, you got no horse in the game. That's the whole point. Or, or dog in the race. Horse, how, what's the thing? No one knows. You've you got no uh, skin in the game. So you're just there uh, answering questions. So you've got to just stay calm, right? That's all you have to do. Exactly. I mean, the pay is the same whether you win or lose, and, you, and you're a very small piece of the overall argument. But in jury trials, most of the experts come across as extremely dry. Sure. And uh, uh, – kind of professorial and uh, I don't you know you can tell from my accent I'm I come across more as a, a good old boy that you know worked in a plant just like the plant in their hometown and they do tend to identify with my point of view uh, which I suppose is why why uh, I've got a market so that's so that's awesome so you put those four things together you make hundred and eight thousand dollars a year what's the plan going forward I'm just curious I mean at what point do you look at Social Security 70 yeah, I'll probably put it off. I, I, my earnings record qualifies me for the maximum you can get, and uh, so that's a little over fifty grand, I think, projected at uh, sixty-six. So it'll be a little more than that at seventy. And uh, but I, I and pro- I'm thinking around seventy. I'll probably back off on some of these. I've also got nine volunteer side gigs I do that don't pay anything, but that are real jobs. I like chairing a college and chairing a big foundation, a charity foundation, and Man. You know, university advisory committees and the state chamber chairing that, and just just a bunch of those things. I do kind of like to stay busy. Well, where, where do you find your energy? Do you, Are you an investor in five-hour energy? Like, what, what? how do you get your energy? Well, we, my wife and I are runners. We run uh, there you three go. times a week in the morning, and then we play tennis probably four or five times a week, usually against other people, but sometimes together. See, that's and, it. Uh, we, we're extreme hikers. We... Uh, Actually, we just jumped in the car and drove to Nebraska to see the eclipse of the day and then drove on to Colorado and did a 14,000-plus peak. And uh, that's typical. We don't plan a lot. We just take off and do stuff. All right, so we got to talk about this. I was in Colorado this past week, and I was in the Keystone area, like Breckenridge, Keystone. Okay. I, su- I-, I talked about this on the last episode of the show, too. I suffer from altitude sickness the second I step above 9,000 feet. And I'm a disaster. Do you, do, you, do, you have, do you deal with that, or you or your wife deal with that? Because it's just, it's just random, and it strikes people. I think primarily gingers. But do you struggle well, with that? Yeah, and it's not, it's not no measure of fitness, because my wife and I are pretty fit with the you know, marathons and stuff that we've done. And, uh, but, yeah, we both are kind of a fl- I've got asthma, too, so I, I had never been above t- much above 12,000 feet, so I didn't know how it'd go. We made it to the top, but it was very tough, and we thought about quitting. Uh, but uh, because and she and I got sick that night and uh, she didn't feel well either. So yeah, it's it doesn't matter how tough you think you are. Once you get altitude sickness, you're pretty much done. It's no good. And here's the dumb part, uh, uh, Mike. I, I my, my wife and I are walking around this little town. I'm not feeling well. I'm like, you know what? Let's just sit down, have a beer, and relax. I drank one beer, and I felt like I'd been tailgating at, at an SEC football game for three months. Uh, uh, I know. I understand. We got to the very top of this thing and, and coming down. I'm, about 100 yards from the top, I took a bad fall. My foot slipped out from under me, and I, and I really crushed my bad knee that's already kind of worn out from marathons and then had a five-mile hike to go down. Ooh. So about, a, about two miles down, I had snuck a little uh, carton of red wine in there, and yes. we split that. It was maybe a glass and a half each. We could barely walk. Yeah. It's a good time. <laughs> it was probably a bad idea, yeah. People are wasting so much money on booze. These young these young the young young bucks, they should just go to altitude, just have a little <laughs> thimble of Jim Beam and they'll be good to go. So, you know, <laughs> as people try to sort of replicate the life you have, which uh, again, objectively, it might not be for everybody, but uh it, it's pretty darn great. You kind of call your own shots, you're financially independent. Uh, you're financially independent. Like, what what takeaways do you give to people uh, to to try to replicate this lifestyle? Well, you've got to control your expenses. I'm, I mean, I had intended to work till I was seventy because I I really enjoyed what I did. Uh, but two or three years before I retired, it just stopped being that much fun. You know, I was working on 
50, 55 hours a week a lot, and, and we had a lot of uh, times I'd have to be out there on a Saturday or a Sunday or a holiday. Our plant ran 24-7 for three or four years at a time, and if it shut down, it, it could lose a million dollars in a yeah. week. So there was a lot of pressure to be there. And, and I guess what I'm saying, long way of saying, is that even if you don't think you want to retire when you're 50, if you're not 50, you don't really know that. Yeah. And so, so the key is to have enough money to make the decisions you want to make because if you wait until the decision comes on you and you haven't saved, you got no choice. you got to work. Yeah, I, I don't think people think about that a lot, Mike. I, I don't think people uh, want to give themselves the flexibility that they should give themselves. I, I, my personal philosophy is make tomorrow easier. And, and, and in order to do that, you have to do what's tough today because I want to help myself out in the future, you know? Oh, I understand. I mean, I absolutely hate running. I always hated it, but I've run tens of thousands of miles because I thought it contributed to my health, made my tennis better, and just, just made me better all around for having the discipline to do it. And, uh, yeah, I think it paid off, even though it wasn't always pleasant. It won't be pleasant tomorrow morning at 10 till 5 when the alarm goes up and I've got to get up and run. What expenses did you avoid? Obviously, you avoided new cars. You didn't avoid wine, which that's good. You shouldn't avoid wine. It's delicious. Uh, <laughs> Inexpensive wine. Well, uh, uh, we avoided, avoided mostly new cars, we, and we avoided uh, big houses. Uh, avoided divorce, avoided <laughs> yeah. moving. I mean, I, I don't say that lighthearted. No, I mean, I'm, I'm with terrible you. Terrible thing. But yeah, it's fast. I've got friends who had a virtually identical careers to mine, but they've been married three or four times and they're broke because I don't care what kind of a 401k you have, if you cut it in half and then you cut it in half and then you cut it in half, there's nothing left. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so, and there's that. And then how about raising your kids? You didn't have to pay for college because. Uh, of, well, they were bright. Yeah. I mean, that, that they were kind of brainiacs, but but they also learned to enjoy school and to enjoy studying. And you know, there was a pretty high bar at home. I, mean, I give my wife most of the credit, but they always got their homework in, and and we didn't do the work for them. We would proofread stuff, and we would uh, help them if they were stuck for ideas. But, but we uh, we required them to do their own work, and they, uh, you know, they got six degrees between them, and they're all. Successful. Two of them are engineers. There's a medical doctor, a uh, uh, professional educator at the college level. They're they're all doing well. That's great. But I think a lot of it was having having a mom that could spend a lot of time with them, who could volunteer in the schools and work with their teachers. And did Did you do much vacationing? I'm always curious of this because I have a little bit of a vacation problem, and the problem is I don't like to vacation. How much vacationing did you do, and how much did you spend on vacations during your kids' uh, younger years? Probably not as much as most people. Uh, we did a lot of uh, weekend stuff. Uh, we we liked to hunt and fish, and uh, my son was a big hunter and fisherman, so and uh, we liked the outdoors. So we did a lot of local stuff on weekends. My job didn't take me on the road very often, except during the lobbying years when they were pretty much grown. Uh, but conventional week-long vacations, frankly, I had a little trouble getting away from work. I didn't mind it at the time, and. I spent tons of time with my kids because my commute was like eight minutes. Oh. And in spite of the, sometimes having to work on a Saturday or Sunday, I usually got out of there at five, and I didn't usually go in there early. So. Now, you did mention something that is a current interest of mine, and Nicole, my producer, is she's on the other side of a wall, but I can see that she's currently rolling her eyes probably. Uh, you mentioned fishing. What do you like to fish for, Mike? Oh, everything. My wife and I are big bass fishers. Oh, my I gosh. I, you mentioned that on your show, though. The I'm addicted to that it. for the last few weeks. Oh, my gosh. I am addicted. I can't. Th I'm current. Here's where I'm at mentally. I'm 39 years old and angry that I've wasted 39 years not bass fishing. That's where I'm at. Sitting on the wall by me is an 8-pound bass and a 20-pound oh. brown trout right behind my desk here in my little office. Oh uh, we, uh, we had a great year. My, the, I got a new bass boat. I mean, it's not a $70,000 bass boat. It's sure. like a $20,000 bass boat, aluminum. But the first fish we caught out of that boat that I caught was an eight-pound largemouth bass. Oh. I believe that. Uh, we got we to gotta arrange a trip here. So my personal yeah, best... Yeah, I take you fishing. Uh, my personal best of being one month into fishing is 4.2-pound uh, largemouth bass. good. I fished for two years before I broke two pounds. Well, I live in, I live in a really ritzy area of town, so I, I, something tells me these fish were flown in especially for me to catch. <laughs> Um, very well-educated fish. 
Uh, all right. So, you know, the reason we had you on today, clearly, I, I, I can't help you. I mean, you, you, you're the one helping me. You're the one helping other people. And that seems like what you've done your whole life. But we just want to give examples of what it is to do it the right way. So, uh, Mike, thank you for, for being an example. Anything else you want to add before we go? Well, I, one thing I didn't mention is we absolutely maxed out. the four, They didn't have 401ks when I started working. Right. I'm that old. But... but Ten years later, when they start, I would have a lot more money if they had. But, but we maxed it out every year. We also maxed out Roths every year we were eligible, and if we weren't, we we still maxed out a post-tax IRA. Okay. And then we put a similar amount in in brokerage non-tax shelters. So I mean, it's just you need to be saving everywhere you can. I, I mean, you uh, you know the book. I'm I'm sure whether you've read it or not, but you're living. It's the old Millionaire Next Door. You know the yeah. classic, classic book. Um, that. If you want to live the life like Mike is, you should you should read it. So, uh, Mike, thank you, thank you, thank you, and keep catching largemouth bass, but save some. If you for want me. to go fishing, just get in touch with me, and I'll I'll take you on a fishing trip where you can't miss. Uh, look for the email coming soon. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, everybody, that's it for this week's show. Be like Mike. If I could be, if I could be like Mike. You know, sometimes we need these examples. Maybe you identify with Mike. Maybe you don't. Maybe you listen to him. You're like, well, that's a terrible life. First of all, you're wrong because it's an amazing life. He just sits back and bass fishes and helps his community. He's a great guy. I like it. So that's it for this week's show. Be like Mike. I'm going to go fishing. Peace. This is where I came from. Planet Love Tribe, where we drop love bombs, funk missiles, and live in soul shelters. No help to skelter. The heat don't swelter because everybody stays cool. Left many moons ago to bring the philosophies of my ancestors to another place, God. Pick the third rock, gave me to my Earth family and told me to create, and so I am. Pin in my hand, microphone on the stand, over vinyl, I command and demand. Magnificence in an instance, I can make you dance, cry, or love. Fly as a dove, released from Everest. The fresh is fresh, and you can call me E.T. or to John Tesh. Let me bless this harmonic presentation. It's amazing, so amazing. I'm the reason. Uh. Salutations, I bring you love, Tron greetings from a far away land. I am the sole controller. Put the remote down and let me take control. You're now a part of my zone, so enjoy yourself. Love, Tron can restore your health. I bring you greetings. Uh, salutations, how you doing? And is that how y'all say it? The tinkling of the keys is an homage to the little, little star. I sojourn over poetic descriptions of sound and travel to my other world. Out of this world, spaceship on my arm took me home, filled by the ink and the megabytes and the hypertext transfer protocol, stronger than the Skynet and the Terminator. I push faders into warp speed, glide with ease, creating a breeze they call a black hole, event horizon, no rear view concerns. This I adjourn, I adjourn. the beats I burn, I burn, I burn, I burn. This I adjourn, the beats I burn, I burn. Salutations, I bring you love, Tron greetings from a far away land. I am the sole controller. Put the remote down and let me take control. You're now a part of my zone, so enjoy yourself. Love, Tron can restore your health. I bring you greetings. Uh, salutations, how you doing? And is that how y'all say it?